All right, let's get started. My name is Lewis, and I want to thank you so much for attending my Optimize Your Energy seminar today here on Zoom. I'm sorry I cannot be with you all in person, but in lieu of current circumstances, I hope that each one of you will take something from today's lecture that will be very helpful in your health and fitness journeys moving forward. So I ask just a couple of things as we stay in this presentation, please keep yourself muted until the very end. And also I would ask that if anyone has questions, there is a chat bar on the bottom, please type your questions in the bottom and I would be happy to answer them at the conclusion of today's seminar. So I'm going to switch over to my PowerPoints here. So the title of my presentation today is Optimize Your Energy. And I believe this is a critical topic because I have conversations with many members and many of my clients who talk about when I go out on the golf course, I play a great first nine and I don't play a great second nine, I get very tired. And for health purposes, it's important that we understand the way our bodies balance energy how we can improve cardiovascular function and how we can tie in some of our strategies to nutrition. So in order to talk about energy, I have four relevant concepts that I believe are critical to understanding the larger picture of what we will discuss today. What if I told you that there is one variable that means more to longevity than any other when it comes to our ability to keep our hearts healthy? Well, there is. It's called the VO2 max, and I will discuss that today and how that plays directly into longevity. Second thing I want to talk about today is how we can improve cardiovascular health with practical strategies. We're coming out of the textbook here. We're coming into what we can actually do when we step into the Healthy Lifestyle Center, when we step on the golf course, when we go for a walk, or when we play tennis. Third thing is I want to briefly discuss some of my nutritional optimizations. Optimization is the right word here because I'm not asking you to completely change your diet or don't eat any more sweets and don't eat any more pastas and don't eat any more breads. No, no, no. All I want to do is talk about some of the simple ways that we can manage our food intake to maximize our feeling of well being and energy. And finally, I need to explain how you can individualize these ideas for yourself, that you don't necessarily need the advice of a doctor. You don't necessarily need the consult of a personal trainer or physical therapist. You could become your own advocates for healthy living. Before I go any further, I do have a couple of disclaimers that I need to mention. Number one, the information I provide today is not medical advice, is not intended to be medical advice, and does not supersede the advice of your medical physician, especially when we talk about cardiovascular recommendations and heart rates. Secondly, I am not a nutritionist nor a registered dietitian. So when I talk about nutrition, it will be from a very general point of view and it is not designed to be specific to any one dietary strategy. Thirdly, the field of human performance constantly evolves. I've mentioned this in my other seminars. There is constantly new research being brought up. Things that we know to be true today might not necessarily be true tomorrow. So it's just worth keeping in mind. And lastly, your safety is your priority. So if you're taking in these ideas and trying to apply them and you don't feel safe or you don't feel comfortable, they might, not just, they might just not be for you. So the first thing I want to discuss is some of the variables when we discuss heart health that I feel are very important. The first one is really easy to ascertain as well. It's resting heart rate. How many times our heart beats per minute when we are not doing anything? And this can give us a good indication of heart efficiency because the more the heart has to pump, the less efficient the body is at taking in the oxygen, taking in the nutrients, taking in the blood. It could mean that you're dehydrated because we have something called stroke volume, which is how much blood is ejected from the heart with each pump. If we're dehydrated, and our blood volume is lower because of less water, the heart has to beat more. So as we know, there's a relationship between dehydration 
and impairment in performance or even sometimes people passing out. So that's one indicator of health and function. The other is how well we can accept and utilize oxygen. When we look at the heart's resting rate, we also want to consider the heart's maximum rate. Many of you in this population have probably been to a cardiologist and they probably run what they consider a stress test. That stress test does not necessarily push you to a maximal heart rate, but it allows the researcher to perform equations to get an idea of where your heart's maxing out at. As we're getting older, the maximal heart rate value tends to drop linearly with age. But it's important to recognize that between your maximum heart rate and your resting or minimal heart rate, we want to see variability. We want to see a large difference between, let's say, a resting heart rate of 60 and a maximal heart rate of 180. That means that when our body is put under stress, whether we're walking on the golf course or in the gym, the heart is efficient at managing undulations in performance. And now I mentioned the longevity equation before. And the really important value to consider here is what we call VO2 max. That is a value that tells us how well our body can take in oxygen, utilize oxygen, and convert that oxygen into usable energy. So if our VO2 max is held higher, we can take in and produce more energy from the oxygen that we breathe. There's a researcher of who the name escapes me. He was an exercise physiologist, and he looked at linear declines in VO2 max. So as you see on the top, VO2 max drops about 1% a year as we age. He drew out a graph and he predicted when he would die based upon his VO2 max score and the decline that he expected to see. And what do you know, he was within a year of his actual passing. So that tells us that if we can exercise the right ways to keep our VO2 max at its highest, to keep our oxygen consumption and utilization high, we can stay healthier and we can promote longevity. So how does our body actually produce usable energy? So if you look at this pyramid here, I kind of graph it out. So the top line is what we call ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Don't worry, there's no exam once this is over. But ATP is the fuel for our body. And our muscles, which promote skeletal movement and function, only contain a very small amount of inherent energy. So luckily for us, the body has a number of ways to get fuel back into our muscles, back into our liver, back into our brain. And that is what we call anaerobic or aerobic metabolism. Anaerobic means without oxygen. And aerobic means with oxygen. So some of the exertion that we put out utilizes not oxygen, but glycogen, which is carbohydrate, which are your pastas, your breads, the stored form of sugars in your muscles, in your bloodstream can create energy. So when I talk about anaerobic metabolism, consider the fact that when we're breathing, that energy is not necessarily refueling our energy stores. And I'll talk about that a little bit later when it comes to the practical applications. As you'll see, when our VO2 max or our oxygen consumption requirement rises above 65%, we tend to shift into using more stored sugars for energy rather than breathable oxygen. Aerobic metabolism, as referenced by the picture there, that is a mitochondria, which is kind of an organelle in our body that takes oxygen, utilizes oxygen. It also helps us to burn stored body fat. So when we take in oxygen, it provides the spark to obtain a large amount of energy, and it can also help to release fat molecules and burn fat for energy. So when we talk about fat loss strategies, the aerobic considerations are very important. And this occurs around 65% or less of our maximal oxygen. 
I know these terms can get a little bit complicated. All you really need to think about is the more intense the exercise, the more we're going to rely on stored sugars. The lower intensity exercise or just living your normal day, going to the dining room and eating, things that don't require a high amount of exertion tend to use more of our oxygen stores. Of course, for the complete picture of health and longevity, both are very important. So when we discuss cardiovascular training, I want to break this down into four distinct criteria of how I believe we tend to exercise. And the first one on the left is steady state cardio. So steady state, in, it references the heart rate and keeping the heart rate at a specific line, keeping the intensity of the exercise at a specific level. So I show the picture there of two people walking on a treadmill. Let's assume they walked on the treadmill three miles an hour for 30 minutes. That's a steady state bout of exercise. The benefits of steady state conditioning is that it's very safe for beginners, someone who's new to exercise, because you can easily control the intensity and you can keep the intensity pretty low. It allows you to precisely measure heart rate. Now, lots of us nowadays have smart watches and GPS and we can measure our heart rate anytime we want. But keep in mind the machines in the Healthy Lifestyle Center also have heart rate measures on them. We can keep our heart rate at one specific spot, and I'll talk about later how important that is. Finally, because the demand, the metabolic demand in the body is low, it's excellent for recovery and blood flow. So if you have an injury, if any, any of you have been to our physical therapy center, the first thing I've told you to do before you even start therapy is let's hop on the bike, let's hop on the treadmill. I want you to warm up for a few minutes. Well, the warm up bout is essentially a steady state bout of exercise. Next thing is aerobic interval training. So that is how we can take basically two or three or four zones of heart rates and we can shift between a higher bout of exercise for a few minutes and then we cut the intensity back and we calm it down, let the body recover. Then we bump the intensity back up for a few minutes. We reach a plateau, we start to get fatigued we bring everything back down. So in contrast to steady state exercise, we burn more calories when we're working through intervals because there's a period of time when we're working a lot harder. However, it still allows us to bring the intensity back down so we're not crashing our body with fatigue. So it's still a relevant strategy, even in an aging population. The next thing we have to consider is the improvement in aerobic capacity is greater with aerobic intervals versus steady state because you're able to push into higher levels of absolute intensity or higher levels of VO2 max. And finally, the heart has to pump in certain spots harder and faster, and then it has a chance to reset and relax. So we're working heart rate variability. And we're also working the heart's physical ability to contract. The next thing I want to talk about is aerobic, or sorry, anaerobic intervals. Now, anaerobic intervals are most commonly found in sport. And I know some people that might be watching this today are tennis players. And if you consider the bout of tennis, you have one hard burst of activity for a few seconds, and then you have a rest. And we can mimic this in an exercise scenario. Think like the picture I demonstrate here, we have a sprinter. The sprinter will sprint a certain amount of yards or meters, and then he'll rest. And then he'll sprint again really, really hard, and then he'll rest. So because we're now working in very high intensities when we're working these intervals, now we're getting the body more efficient at burning sugars and improving the body's ability to generate energy in both an anaerobic and an aerobic context. Lastly, I mentioned weight training and I show a picture of a group exercise class. I know the group exercise class has been extremely popular here at Glen Eagles, and unfortunately, we've had to cut back on a lot of them due to COVID. But regardless, the undulation of heart rate between picking up a weight, let's say using the example of the picture, pressing it overhead, 
and then we put it down, you have a few seconds to rest, and then we're going into planks, and then we're going into push-ups. Well, that exercise followed by rest, followed by exercise, followed by rest, creates a lot of undulations in our heart rate. So even if we're not necessarily performing cardiovascular exercise, if we are raising our heart rate and lowering our heart rate, we're helping the heart to become more efficient, stronger, and improving its variability. As I talked about before, having a higher variability between your resting rate and maximal rate is extremely important. And finally, having a lower resting rate is something we should all strive for because it means that our parts are becoming more efficient. And efficiency, as we saw from the VO2 max, is the key to longevity. Now, that sounds great, but how can we actually implement the strategies of cardiovascular conditioning? Well, I'm going to break this down into two sections. Our aerobic conditioning, which is the conditioning where we're going to rely on our body's oxygen stores, and then our anaerobic conditioning, which is relying on the body's sugar stores. So if you look at the chart on the left, that's showing a graph, and it's a little blurry, but hopefully you can still see the beats per minute of our heart rate and how it correlates to these different metrics of aerobic versus anaerobic fitness. So when we're talking about improving heart function, improving our ability to breathe and maintain air, we're going to keep our heart rate at a lower level where we can maintain an output of exercise for a few minutes. So when we talk about energy systems, some of our energy stores last longer and some of them end quicker, and that depends on intensity. So if we are working with oxygen, these are bouts of exercise that are going to last for minutes at a time. Now, one of the biggest issues that I see with members all the time in the Healthy Lifestyle Center when starting an exercise program or even in a routine of exercise is that I'm going to give an example. I have a client who comes in, who goes on the stationary bike and puts it on resistance level four for 20 minutes. And they do that all the time. And they never change the strategy. They never deviate from the approach and they never check their heart rate. From the time they started that program to three or four or five or six months later, their body has increasingly gotten more efficient at performing that particular action. However, because the body's gotten more efficient at doing that motion, the heart is now under less and less demand, and it's very likely that the heart rate has dropped. Now, what you would say, but isn't that a good thing? You talked about heart rate, no, but when we're exercising, in order to maximize the output of energy from our aerobic system, we want to try to maintain or improve our heart rate's tolerance to work at high intensities. So what I would like to see you all do is utilize your heart rate as an objective measure of health and performance. So how do we do that? Let's go into the gym. Let's find a machine. And I want you to get comfortable using it. So let's say the treadmill. We get on the treadmill, we get comfortable. We put it at three miles an hour. We bump the incline up. And I want you to find a position where it feels good. You feel good exercising and you check your heart rate and you can hold a full conversation while you're doing this. Let's say we arrive at 120 beats per minute. Well, now you know that that is a comfortable aerobic pace for you and one that you can maintain for a long time. Now let's work into a higher threshold. Let's put up the speed or put up the resistance and work a little bit harder. And let's find a position where you can barely get a sentence out. So you're working a lot harder, you're breathing a lot harder but you're not completely exhausted and you could still hold this output for a few minutes. Well, now we have two heart rates. We have a heart rate for your high intensity and we have a heart rate for your low intensity. So now, instead of just hopping on the treadmill or hopping on the bike and doing the same exact thing every time you come to the gym, let's work some aerobic intervals. Let's ascertain the benefits of pushing your heart to a higher level 
while still reaping the benefit of the recovery period that you see when we drop the intensities down. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit. Actually, it's a little bit ahead, I'm sorry. So when I talk about the work and rest ratios, your short or high intensity interval, even within an aerobic context, should be shorter than the amount of time you spend in your low interval. So let's say you work for three minutes hard. You could still breathe, you could still hold the conversation, but it's difficult. And you have a measure of what your heart rate is in that intensity. Let's hold it for three minutes. Let's bring it back down. Let's take 10 minutes at a low intensity. Let's bump it back up to three. Let's bump it back. So we did 26 minutes, 25 minutes, let's say. That's a reasonable bout of cardio, but we have six minutes in there where we are going to reap tremendous benefits of pushing into a higher level of function while it's still staying aerobic and we're still utilizing the oxygen to help our bodies. Now, I utilized this chart here to give you an example of the work rests, but it's even more important when we talk about anaerobic implementation or the things that we do that don't necessarily use our oxygen. I'm going to use a tennis player as an example. So we have a tennis player who, let's say they're playing singles, they're in the club championship, and they have a rally, one point that could last 15, 20, 25 seconds if they're really, really good or really in a struggle. And now they have about 40 seconds to recover, and then they have to be ready again. And I've talked to a lot of people who say, some of those hard rallies are getting tired. And if you're tired, you're seeing a drop in performance. So I'm all about how do we increase performance? Well, we need to train within the interval that mimics the way our body naturally works. So we have sugars. We burn those sugars for energy. And if you look at the second line from the top on that graph, that would be referred to as fast glycolysis, 15 to 30 seconds of hard, intense effort, which sounds a lot like a tennis rally. Now look at the work to rest ratio, one to three to one to five. So we work hard for 20 seconds and we rest for 60 seconds. This can be mimicked in the context of our fitness center with our equipment. Let's say we hop on one of our espresso bikes. We put up the resistance. You pedal really hard for 15 seconds, 20 seconds, just enough where you feel out of breath. I can no longer keep this pace up. Well, now we're taking it way down. We're going to bring the body back into somewhat of a steady state. Let the heart rate drop. Then we feed it that intensity again. So now we're training in a very specific context to your activities. How do we incorporate intervals when we are outside running? Let's say you're a little bit concerned about COVID, you don't want to come in the gym, and you just walk outside. It's kind of hard to objectively measure heart rate when you're walking, and it's kind of hard to increase intensity. Let's say you add a short little jog. If you're able to jog, we jog for, let's say, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and then you walk for a couple of minutes, we bring everything back down. But then we jog again, we push the heart a little bit, push the heart a little bit more, then we bring it back down. Well, now the heart has become increasingly more efficient over time. And if we can improve the heart's ability to utilize sugars and utilize oxygen, we can help to keep our sense of alertness and health. We can also decrease our objective measures of heart rate when both from a resting perspective and trying to maintain a higher maximum so we have a higher variability in our heart rate. So the last thing I want to talk about briefly today are how nutrients play a role in energy balance in our bodies. So these are the three primary food groups and I know they look very delicious but it's important to kind of realize what each macronutrient does in our body. Now, if you were to read a food label and you look at the total calories, and then you break it down across these three food groups, protein, carbohydrates, and fats on the label, 
If you did the calorie calculations, you would find that these three totals combined basically equal the total amount of calories in the food. So understand that pretty much every food is going to have some blend of proteins, carbs, and fats. And it's important to kind of realize what each one does. So proteins are essentially the building blocks of our body. They help us to maintain muscle mass. And it's very important for a number of functions with regards to the amino acids that are contained within our proteins. So because they're so essential and because our body does not have the ability to absorb a tremendous quantity of protein at any one given time, for most people and most dietary recommendations, it's going to be a relatively level amount of protein throughout the day, throughout each meal to have some protein consumption. The fats on the bottom there, you can see some of the food groups, some of our nuts, avocados, our oils. Let's talk about healthy fats here. Fats help to mobilize vitamins in our body. They're very important for creating hormones. And I know sometimes fat has an association with cholesterol, but our healthy cholesterols are very important as they help our body produce more hormones. So if you're somewhat hormone deficient, it's important to consider fats in the diet. Now, what I want to really discuss today are carbohydrates, because I keep mentioning that anaerobic metabolism, the, the, the metabolism that doesn't utilize oxygen in the body is utilizing stored sugars. And all carbohydrates in some way break down and can be stored as glycogen molecules in our muscle, in our liver. So these are the foods we love to eat our breads, our pastas, our sweets, our vegetables. We'll get back to that one later. When we look at the pattern of energy intake from food in the body, carbohydrates are the body's preferred source of energy. As a matter of fact, there's an enzyme in our mouth, salivary amylase, that immediately starts digesting carbs as soon as they hit the tongue. Most of our protein breakdown occurs all the way down in the stomach. And the majority of fat breakdown occurs in the small intestine. So when we take a meal in that's carbohydrate rich, we are going to get a more immediate jolt of energy. And it's important to time this jolt of energy with the activities that we need to perform that day. So essentially, we need to choose the right foods at the right times. If you are a golfer and you look at the length of time that you're golfing, which could be two, three, four, five, six hours, a lot of shots in the water, don't worry. It's very important that we time our carbohydrate intake around the times of the day that we need to fill our energy stores. Within that, there are different types of carbohydrates, and we have nutrition education programs here at the Healthy Lifestyle Center via Zoom. That would be really, really critical in helping you understand the different types of carbohydrates. But basically, simpler carbohydrates break down faster in the body and produce more sugars in the bloodstream in an immediate context. So if we're lacking in energy, and we need to get out and have energy now. That's the best time for you to have more of your sugary items or your sweet items with those simpler carbohydrates to give you that quick burst of energy. Conversely, the worst time to have your simple sources of carbohydrate energy is when most of us eat them, which is at dinner and dessert. So if you're eating a very small or even no breakfast, and a moderate lunch and a heavy dinner with desserts and breads and pastas where we're overloading our body's source of energy at night when our body's about to go to sleep and we're not going to use it so the body says well i don't need this now but i might need it later so it stores it as fat because remember our environment has changed massively in the last few thousand years but our genetics haven't caught up so we still have hunter-gatherer genetics that if our ancestors 
were not able to find food for days on end. We could survive off of our fat stores, but we now have a proliferation of food where we no longer have that problem. So we need to be very conscious of eating the simpler types of carbohydrates when we need immediate energy, the complex carbohydrates when we need energy over a period of time. So just to give a brief example, the difference between blending fruit and juicing fruit is that when you blend fruit, you obtain the fiber in the fruit and the pulp and everything that helps to slow down the absorption of the sugars. Gives it a more delayed release or something starchy like a rice. Harder for the body to immediately digest. So the energy that it gives us lasts a little bit longer. Now, the second thing, of course, is understand the right amounts of food to eat. And that is a science that I am not about to tackle because it's very individualized. And it's why if any of you are struggling with energy management and you feel it might be related to your food or you're struggling with weight management, it's important that you consult the advice of a true nutrition professional. Now, once you establish that you're eating the right foods at the right times, you're going to optimize the body's absorption of nutrients to produce your energy. Combined with increasing the efficiency of your heart, we generate a total picture of health, well-being, and optimal energy for you. I want to thank you all so much for listening today, and I hope that you all took something from this presentation that will help you in the future. My name is Lewis. Once again, thank you so much. I will now answer any questions. Let me check the chat, and you can all unmute yourself if you have any questions to ask me here live. Okay, no questions via chat, but I open this up. I see a couple of you here. Do you want to unmute yourselves and ask me a few interesting questions? Lewis. Yes. Yeah, you know, I kind of miss, I couldn't hear what you said about optimizing when you eat what. Could you just uh, review that a little bit? Yes. So we talked about the three main food sources, or I should say food groups, the carbohydrates, the yeah. protein, and the fats. And what I really discussed today was how the carbohydrates specifically are the body's preferential source of energy. And where I see most people going wrong, and remember, I talk to quite a few people here, clients of mine, other members, is that we eat far too little carbohydrates and, and generally far too little food around the times that we need energy. And we eat far too much food in the times of the day right before bed or when we're about to take a nap and times that we don't need the food. So I don't know if you caught the very beginning when I said, I'm not asking you to make radical shifts in your dietary habits, but it's more of just understanding where to place the foods that you're eating in order to maintain a, your best energy output. So your simple carbohydrates, your, your sugary foods, your, uh, your, you know, your fruits and, and stuff like that, those would be, and I'm not saying you should have them because I can't give you specific recommendations, but to, those would be the kinds of things you might want to take in if you're about to go play golf and you're feeling a little tired, you need the energy right now. Some of your, like something like an oatmeal that's going to give you energy throughout a period of time. The stuff that we have, like we have heavy desserts and, and meals that are full of bread and pasta don't provide us any benefit when they're taken in at the wrong times. Unless, I have to preface, unless you're an elite athlete and you've heard some people like before they run a marathon the night before they'll eat a lot of pasta, there is some carryover, yes, but in from, from talking to people that I've seen, that's usually not the case. It's usually that they're neglecting to eat the right or enough food early or around their exercise, around their golf, around their tennis, and they're eating too much in the wrong times. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Louis. I'll mute myself. Okay. 
Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, I guess that will be all then. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Okay, I look forward you to seeing you all for my lecture in April. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Bye.